you're listening to the Prepper Recon Podcast. For questions, comments, and podcast archives, go to PrepperRecon.com. I've personally been buying gold and silver from JM Bullion for over two years. They offer the best prices over spot that I can find, and I've never had a problem with an order. If you're looking to trade in some of your fiat paper for real money, check out jmbullion.com today. Hey, Preppers and Patriots. I've got a big announcement today. The Days of Elijah, Book 2, Wormwood, is now available on Amazon.com, and it's out in paperback, Kindle, and it's also out in audiobook. So the audio usually takes a little longer, but Kevin Pierce, my audiobook producer, was able to get it in early so we could start the approval process in time for it to come out with the other versions. And as always, I'm hosting a giveaway to celebrate the release. I'm giving away a fully stocked Prepper Recon IFAG, and that's complete with the Israeli battle dressing, quick clot, tourniquet. There's a suture kit in there, which has uh, three pre-threaded sutures, hemostats, um, 3M Steri strips. Uh, you get a, a pair of EMT shears, nitri- nitro gloves, sanitizer, burn gel, antibiotic gel, Advil. There's gauze, band-aids, tough strip band-aids, and uh, regular band-aids. And that all comes in a uh, Molly compatible zip-up pouch that's that's perfect for your uh, backpack or your car or just to have around the house. To enter the giveaway, simply leave a review for The Days of Elijah, Book 2, Wormwood, on Amazon.com. Then send an email to PrepperRecon at gmail.com and include your Amazon screen name in the text. And for the subject line, use Wormwood Giveaway. The winner's screen name will be posted on PrepperRecon.com on March 31st. And the winner will also be notified via email. Now back to the show. Today's guest is Gary Collins of the Primal Power Method. Gary, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on again, Mark. I always enjoy being on your show. Oh, absolutely. So you've just finished your new book, Going Off the Grid. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. It's uh, been quite an effort. People don't realize that that's a 10-year book right there. Yeah, so, yeah, because it's not like uh, uh, writing a well, novel where you just got to think of a story. You actually lived all this stuff. You did it. Yeah, and that's the whole point. I never intended to write a book about it. Um, I've been on this journey. Like I said, it started 10, maybe even 11 years ago now, and it just started as a dream of I grew up very remotely. I grew up pretty close to living off the grid as you could. The place I lived in when I graduated from high school, I had 50 people in it. I had to drive 30 miles to get into my town of 1,800 people. So I lived pretty remotely, and the only thing we had tied in was electricity and phone. Otherwise, it was there was no there was no cable TV. We had our own septic. We had our own well. We lived in a, a mobile home, a single wide, real nice, probably an old one, not not the nicest. So I grew up similar. It wasn't too too far off. But I started to kind of want to get back when I was in the government, and I said, hey, I want to get a more remote lifestyle. So I started searching for land quite a while ago, but it was during the boom, and so prices were pretty high. So I said, okay, this is a little unaffordable. Let me sit back and let me see and reevaluate, and it's like I said, that's where it started, and it's been an ongoing plan, and the book came from people basically finding out what I was doing. I was doing interviews talking about my Primal Power Method Health Series. And I said, hey, you know, yeah, I bought some, I'm looking for land, or I bought, I think I had bought it at that point and said, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to build a house off the grid. You know, I'm not quite sure which direction I'm going yet, but I know that's what I want to do. Well, I started getting questions. People started emailing me. And I went, oh, God, I didn't realize people were really interested in what I was doing on this. This was a personal thing. It had nothing to do with business or anything I was doing as far as primal power methods. And so I decided, you know, I better document this. I better start taking this stuff down. And so I started videoing it. And that's where it started is the YouTube videos showing the process, what I was doing. And from there, I started writing a couple blog posts about it. And the interest kept going up. Then all of a sudden, those shows started popping up. You know, teeny homes and uh, building off the grid, building Alaska, all this stuff started showing up. And I went, well, maybe I better, you know, take it. And so I decided to write a book about it. And I think I'm one of the few people who 
and I've done this in everything I do. Anyone who follows me knows I don't talk about anything I don't do myself or at least have some good knowledge in. I just, I don't believe in that. So everything in that book I did, it's one of those, I did take you through my whole process over the last 10 years. And then it's a how to on top of it, because I learned a lot of lessons along the way, met a lot of people who have done the same thing. And so it, it's one of those, I had to, even though I may not have used something, I had to research it because it was an option for my property. You know, so, so I had a, a perfect example is the different types of septic systems. You know, I, I've always used gravity fed. That's what we used with a leach field. Pretty simple setup, been around forever. Well, I got a couple not so honest contractors telling me I needed a pressure system, which meant that I didn't have enough topsoil to dig down deep enough to get a proper leach field and all this. And I went, no, you know, I grew up on a, we grew up in pretty rocky mountains. I went, I don't know if I buy that, but I had to investigate it. So I had to research a pressure system and look into the different avenues. So yeah, I didn't use that system, but I had to sure, had, sure in the heck I had to research it and know what, what, what kind of topography or what kind of land that is used for. So it's one of those where during the process, the things I researched, I put in there to show people the different options, you know, like an outhouse. Now I got a ton of questions. Why don't you just put an outhouse? Yeah. They don't let you do that anymore. <laughs> you know, there's some, there's some County codes that they don't appreciate you. Especially if you live at the top of the hill, <laughs> putting an outhouse in. And I, and I go, that, that's where it gets a little complicated. I go, sure. You can put one in. They catch you doing it. Boy, you're going to get fined. You're going to get in all kinds of trouble. You have to tear it down, fill it up. You know, if I was building a seasonal cabin and, and I put it in, in and I put the building permit in that way, well, yeah, sure, I could have possibly an option of an outhouse. But as a permanent residence that I'm going to get an owner occupancy certificate for, no, I cannot put an outhouse in. It's against county code. So that's our, you know, I had to learn and kind of teach people how some of this stuff worked and you know, like uh, composting toilets. They go, well, why don't you just put a composting toilet in? Well, once I did the math on it, it cost almost the same amount as putting in a septic system. So why would I put composting toilets in? They're a mess. And the reviews I got on it, I called people and talked. They said, don't buy one. They go, they're garbage. You're better just getting a, a bucket, putting a toilet seat on it, than buying one of these $2,000 thrones that you get because they're huge. And so, yeah, it's kind of that. I had to research all this stuff. So I, I, so far the feedback's been good. Uh, everyone goes, hey, yeah, this is, you know, it's not just a story. It definitely is a how-to. You know, he gives you, I give you all the steps. You know, I tell you from, from living in the city in a big house, how you downsize, get rid of your stuff, move into a smaller place, reevaluate, figure out what you want to do, downgrade again, because that's what I did. I went through phases of shrinking my stuff and in the end it fit in a uh you know small u-haul trailer and that was my whole belongings and it was mainly tools my bikes and my two mountain bike road bike and clothes that's what was in there that was it so i think uh it was good it was good for me to write it down too it, it helped me because it, it made me realize the journey and what it involved. If I wouldn't have documented it, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think it would have been the same. Yeah. There's a massive learning curve. Anytime you get any, any <laughs> type of project like that. Uh, we were talking before the show about, you know, having to sort of hunt and peck your way through, uh, self publishing. You know, that's what I did for the first two years and, and just trying to get it all figured out. And you know, and we were talking about uh, for anybody out there, if you're if you're not into to, to write, you're never thinking about writing a book. This probably doesn't apply to you. But for anybody out there that's thinking about writing a book, thinking about self publishing, this guy Mark Dawson, uh, he's got a podcast. It's called the Self Publishing Formula. He now offers a self publishing 101 course. This the the last enrollment was uh, something like seven hundred dollars for this course. And the next enrollment, enrollment is probably going to go up because the last one sold out in, in like a couple of weeks. But uh, but the money that I would have saved by having somebody take me through that two-year learning curve 
I mean, you know, $700, $7,000, $70,000 would have probably been a bargain if I'd have had somebody yeah. to, to take me through all that. And, and that's just self publishing a book, you know, or a series of books. You know, you gotta, if, if you're start talking about bigger numbers, you, that's, that's probably obviously somebody that's writing more than one book. But, but for somebody that's thinking about building a, an off grid property, I can't imagine what the what writing this book actually cost you in blood, sweat, tears, and treasure. And, and for you, you know, to offer it fun. now for yeah. and what's the price of the book now? Two ninety nine. Uh, it's going to be. It will be uh, actually three ninety nine. Three ninety nine. Uh, either I think it's going to be three ninety nine. I've got to go in there and change it. By the time this comes out, it will be changed, and yeah. it's fifteen ninety five in hard copy. Um, yeah, yeah. So fifteen ninety nine for the hard copy, and you're talking about. I, I I'm guessing oh. I, there's no way it was less than a hundred thousand dollars. The 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 what you've got into the research in this book. Well, that's the thing. The house and the property is the research. My time and right. effort. Absolutely. And that's, the, that's the biggest biggest response I've gotten back is people and in the reviews they've said and people anyone who buys my book please review it on Amazon I'm a self published guy as Mark knows those are gold for me those that was, those help me sell books I it mean, really really does those are, it does and people hate doing them but gosh it, it's such a big help for me to do those reviews um, but that's what I've got now people say hey. This is going to save you a ton of money because I did. I, I made obviously a lot of mistakes in the process because I didn't have anything to go on. You know, there there just isn't a whole lot on this topic. So everyone said this is, and a couple people said, I'm getting ready to build my house right now. Your book couldn't have come out at a better time. And you know, I even have a chapter on how to deal with contractors. Well, dealing with contractors off the grid as opposed to on grid, completely different. It, it, it's not the same animal. I mean, don't get me wrong. They both can be bad. <laughs> contractors, they always dealt with contractors, especially building. I've been dealing with them for 20 years now. They're an interesting group. And it, it, there's always uh, things that go wrong. But off the grid, it's more of a specialty. So there's far fewer guys are, uh, out there, contractors, who know how to build an off-the-grid property. There's fewer electricians who understand off-the-grid solar. Grid tied solar and off the grid solar are way different. They're not the same. So that's where, you know, that section alone, a lot of people have said just that section alone is worth the book, just that one chapter. So I think I did, hopefully I did a good job. Um, and that was the goal. I mean, it wasn't me just telling my story. The whole point of it was to help people, to be honest. I mean, that's why I wrote the book. I knew how hard it was for me and how difficult it was with having nothing to go by. And I said, hey, if I can help some people out, write this book, and that's been the feedback. They're like, hey, you're the only guy that I found who basically did it this way. And so hopefully, you know, that was the goal. And I think, uh, I, think I accomplished it. I don't think I need to write another book on it. If I get enough feedback and people want more information, well, you know, then I'll contemplate it and possibly write another one. But I think this one covers the things that people need to get through the project. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. In the days of Elijah, book two, Wormwood by best-selling author Mark Goodwin, Everett and Courtney Carl have survived the seven seal judgments which devastated the planet, but have their efforts to stay alive been in vain? The next series of judgments to fall upon the earth are known as the Seven Trumpets. Within this series of cataclysms is the earth's collision with a giant asteroid known as Wormwood. The comet will poison much of the planet's fresh water supplies, making survival nearly impossible. With each subsequent trumpet judgment, their odds of living grow slimmer. If Everett and Courtney are to survive, they'll need perseverance, faith, and a great outpouring of providence from the Almighty. Buy your copy of The Days of Elijah, Book 2, Wormwood, in paperback, Kindle, or audio edition from Amazon.com today. You talked about that you had to start by simplifying your life, you know, and, and this is this is a whole, this is a rough thing for, for preppers because we're, uh, 
we're instinctively hoarders, you know, because yeah. we've all got in the back of our mind that Walmart's going to be closed next week. And uh, ever how many rice and beans I want to eat for the rest of my life, I got to get before uh, before the end of business today, you know. And so now we got all this stuff and we got to put it somewhere. And uh, and and that's a tough thing. And 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 I think people got to think about camping. You know, when you go camping, you have to strip down to the essentials because there's a lot of things. If you go on like a three or four day hiking trip in the mountains, yeah, there's a lot of things you might need and might want. And if you put them all in your bag, you're going to have a, a, a tough time standing up because that thing will actually it'll pull you down. It'll pull you over. You know, you hit yeah. you hit one rock side that's sideways, and that's it. That extra fifty, sixty pounds on your back just rolled your ankle, and and now you're now you're sitting on the the side of the trail with a uh, with a sprained ankle and, and a sixty pound pack. You know, well, and, you got to strip right, down to like, the essentials. Yeah. That's why I started there um, because we're addicted to stuff in America today. That's the bottom line. I mean, it's no secret that our economy is based on consuming things, uh, buying things we don't need. And I found I was in that spot. And I have hoarders in my family, so I know the hoarding thing. I, I had more stuff than I needed. I don't have that tendency in me to hoard things, but I definitely had things I did not need. So it was kind of uh, at first, as I, as I explained there, it was very difficult. Because I'd become attached to these inanimate objects that really didn't mean anything in my life. You know, like a kitchen table that I used like four or five times. Some other things. And I just, I remember purging and selling everything in my house. And I put most of it on Craigslist. And two or three people bulk, bought the bulk of it. I mean, came in with it. One guy came up to the trailer and said, walked in and he just started picking everything. Just said, I'll take that, 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 that. And we just loaded it all up. And he took off. And once I had the house was empty, for the most part, I just remember going, you know, I just felt kind of sad in a way. And then about a couple of days later, I felt enormous relief because now I was no longer trapped, A, to the house, B, to the stuff. You know, I'd kind of gotten rid of that burden. And I think that burden is what is holding us back from achieving that more simplistic, more rural in most cases, and, and even one step further, that off the grid dream. That is the, those are the main elements that are in, in inhibiting us from reaching that. And until you get past that point, you're not going to be able to pursue this lifestyle. You have to start there and get rid of the unnecessary clutter in your life because it's going to weigh you down and, and off the grid in itself because of the – just the logistics of the lifestyle, you can't bring all that stuff with you. You can, but it's it's a pain. you got to store it somewhere. You know, when you get up there, it's raw land in most cases. You don't have any place to store that stuff. You need a place to store your tools. You need a place to store materials. You, you know, it, the other things take priority now. You know, you don't want to store, you know, uh, dehydrated food, 55-gallon drums of food. You don't want to do that because that space is very valuable now. And don't get me wrong. You can eventually build and have enough space for all those prepper pieces. But in the beginning, there's no way. You're, you're going to actually make the job 10 times harder hauling all that stuff with you and trying to figure out a place to put it. So I think that life simplification in the beginning, it's critical. And you have to decide, too, what it does is it allows you to decide if that's the lifestyle for you. By doing that and taking that initial step, and I recommend you know, going from a bigger house, either renting it out if you can't get rid of it, and moving into a smaller place that you're renting. Um, I went from house, uh, small cottage, to my travel trailer. I went in those phases in living. And I had it, what it did is it taught me through these phases if that was the life for me. And at the end, I was actually a lot happier. I was saving a lot more money. And I said, yeah, I can do this. So I just didn't jump in. It wasn't one of those things where I just said, I'm doing this. I saw this TV show last night. I'm selling everything or you know, I'm going to go. It was planned out. And I had to determine if that lifestyle, because it's not for everyone. And, and where I live, 
is littered with people who came up there with that dream unprepared, lasted a year, half-built cabin, 4,000 square foot, huge cabin, sitting there still that they haven't sold, and they leave. They go right back to city living or, you know, where they were. So there's a little bit of a process in it, and that's why I started with that first chapter. It, The first thing you got to do in this – well, after you've decided that, that you can live without all your stuff, that you can declutter and clutter, man, that's just, that's one of those things that just, it eats up, uh, eats up a, it's like the hard drive on your, your computer. It's just like a bunch of, if you've got stuff all over your desk, you get stuff all over your house. It's just, it's one of those things that just, you got to think about all that stuff that you're looking at and it keeps you from being able to focus on the things you need to focus on. And and there's just something there's something really freeing, like you said, about about just not having a life that doesn't have too much clutter in it. Well, and that's what I found. You know, once you start digging through the drawers and you start opening stuff up in your attic or your garage, you just go, I haven't seen this in five years. Why do I have it? And that's what I found. I, I just found a lot of odd stuff that you know I'd bought and never used. Um, you know. Uh, I had, I, I think I had like five or six sets of sheets. And I went, why do I have five or, I don't even know why. And it was just one of those that you kind of catch on that you keep buying stuff. We've been programmed to buy stuff. Yeah. Keep the engine running. And the more you buy stuff and the more you keep the engine running and, you know, to, to, today our, our American dream we're taught is home ownership. Buying a house in, you know, either in the city, you know, a townhome or in the suburbs driving into the city, working, we're taught that's the way it is. Well, th now that I've gone through this, I, I, I see it as more of a trap. I see it as they're funneling me where they want me to go. Because once I get in there, it's really hard to get back out, out of that kind of lifestyle. And if you learn, if you learn not to consume just to consume, well, then you can save money. Then you can buy a piece of land. Then you have the money to build something because off the grid too, what people don't understand, going off the grid, there's no bank. There's no off the grid bank out there that's going to finance your off the grid dream. Off the grid, I have a chapter on this too, off the grid finances. You bring cash. That is the only way you're getting this done. You're not going to be able to finance it. I tried. I tried every bank there was. You could get a personal loan, but personal loans are different terms. You're going to pay 10% or more in interest, and more than likely, you're going to have to pay it back very quickly. So it's going to be high interest, pay it back fast. So it's the best option is to save, come up, come up with a plan, save, declutter, then move into it. I, I recommend buying the land first, figuring that part out. You know, take, take a break, figure out what you're going to build, save up for it, and come up with what you know you can afford. You know, I've been doing this now, and on average, talking to people, it's three to five years on average to get the property, build the house, and have it livable. Well, that's because it, you got to pay cash. You got to do it in phases. You got to do it in pieces. You got to do it when the contractors are around. If you live in the mountains, well, it, it's six months out of the year, you don't have a building season for the most part. So there's a lot of factors that go in there. And I think by just realizing that first part of, because I've had people email me and go, I can't afford that. I go, well, yeah, yeah, you can. That's why I wrote the book. I'm proving that an average person can't afford this. I don't care if you're a barista at Starbucks. If you save your money, you downsize, and you don't buy frivolous things, in three to five years, you can have enough money to buy a piece of land and maybe even put something up on it. Anyone can do it. It's just we are taught not to save anymore. That's why, what, 60, 70 percent of people, Americans today have less than $1,000 in their bank account. That's scary. That's really scary. Yeah, that's, that, is, that is horrific, you know, because yeah. that should be everybody's number one priority. Before you start thinking about anything else is, is putting aside – that that emergency fund and it should start at a thousand and then it should build up to six months of your entire uh living expenses to where you could go with no income for six months and 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 not lose your home or your car or or uh not be able to eat that's the end of the first half of my interview with gary collins of the primal power method
Tune in next week for the rest of the show. Ready-Made Resources has a limited number of PVS-30 night vision scopes for $4,700. These are the top-of-the-line night vision scopes used by the U.S. military, which normally sell for over $11,000. Turn your 12-hour rifle into a 24-hour rifle. Visit Ready-Made Resources to get your PVS-30 